What's up guys, it's Prop Deep here with channel Ace Pants and today we're going to talk about the biliary system. We will go over the basic anatomy and physiology, then we'll move on into how gallstones are formed and how it can result in complications like acute cholecystitis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, gallstone pancreatitis, gallstone ileus. Then we'll go on to talk about their pathophysiology, symptomatology, diagnostic modalities, and how to manage them. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's start off with the anatomy of the gallbladder. It is a thin-walled, contractile sac-like organ situated underneath the liver, where the right and the left flow divide. Majority of the gallbladder is covered by the peritoneum, and the rest is attached to the liver. Now, the more surface area of the gallbladder that's attached to the liver, the stronger the anchor it has to the liver. And this becomes problematic when you're trying to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy because the gallbladder is so adhered to the liver that makes it hard for the surgeon to take it off. And this in turn can sometimes cause complications and you might have to convert laparoscopic case to open. But we'll talk more about this in a later video when we talk about open versus laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The function of the gallbladder is to store and release bile which is produced by the liver. The liver produces about 500 to 1000 ml of bile per day. This is excreted through the right and the left hepatic duct which join together to form the common hepatic duct. The gallbladder communicates with the biliary system through the cystic duct which then combines with the common hepatic duct to give rise to the common bile duct. The common bile duct then empties into the duodenum to the ampulla of vetar. And honestly it's sad that after so long I still don't know how to pronounce this. So if I mispronounced it you can correct me um, but I tried my best. And now going back, about one centimeter from where this common bile duct and the duodenum meet, the pancreas empties into the biliary system via the pancreatic duct. Now the secretion of the bile and the pancreatic juices is controlled by the sphincter of OD. During meals, sphincter OD will open up to release bile from the liver and at the same time, the gallbladder will contract to push the stored bile out. And during fasting phase, it will close down and the bile made by the liver will be shifted into the gallbladder instead to be stored. Now let's talk about composition of the bile. It's made up of three components, bile acids, cholesterol, lecithin. The concentration of these three need to be just right to prevent formation of gallstones. And the main component out of these three that contributed to formation of stones is cholesterol. In order for cholesterol to be soluble, the concentration of the bile needs to be just right. It needs to consist of at least 50% of bile acids and small amount of lecithin. Now another thing to keep in mind is that bile acids get recycled when bile is released in the duodenum. About 95% of bile acids get reabsorbed at the terminal ileum and it is shifted back to the liver so it can be reused in forming bile and putting it back into the biliary tract and into the duodenum to be reused. On average, the liver is capable of turning over bile acids two to three times per meal and it can recover up to 20% of bile acid loss. Now, if for whatever reason the losses are greater than 20%, then the concentration of bile will be disturbed and it will result in increased concentration of cholesterol and as we just learned, if bile acids are not more than 50%, then cholesterol is no longer soluble, therefore bile will be thick and prone to forming stones. Alright, so now let's talk about pathologies of the gallbladder. First, we'll start off with cholelithiasis, also known as gallstone disease. So, there are two types of gallstones, mixed and pigmented. Mixed are the most common type in the western world which contain a high proportion of cholesterol as we had discussed earlier. This accounts for about 75% of the stones. The pigmented stones uh, are further divided into two different categories, black pigmented and brown pigmented stones. The black pigmented stones are usually seen with liver cirrhosis and hemolytic anemia and brown pigmented stones are seen with infection. Now patients with cholelithiasis will usually present to you with intermittent colicky dull pain around the epigastric and the right upper quadrant region. Now this occurs because the gallbladder is contracting against the stones in the gallbladder. There is no infection at this stage. However, if the stone is big enough to get embedded in the neck of the gallbladder or if it causes obstruction in the cystic duct, then it can result in infection. The gallbladder will become thickened and distended. And this pathological process is referred to as acute cholecystitis. And these patients will have persistent right upper quadrant pain. And they will also have fever and chills because of the acute infection. Now, let's say this stone from the cystic duct does move down into the common bile duct and cause an obstruction, then this is called cholelithiasis. This has a very similar presentation as cholelithiasis, but these patients will also have jaundice, light color stool, and dark urine. And if this doesn't get treated in a timely manner, or if the stone doesn't pass on its own, 
then it can result in infection of the standstill bile and this will eventually result in cholangitis. And patients with cholangitis will present with the Charcot's triad. And the findings of this triad are right upper quadrant pain, fever, and jaundice. Now cholangitis can progress to suppurative cholangitis if pus develops in the bile. And this is characterized by the Reynolds pentad. And Reynolds pentad includes the Charcot triad plus hypotension and ultimental status. And guys, please keep in mind that patients with cholangitis can deteriorate very rapidly. Therefore, they need to be diagnosed and managed in a timely manner. Now, let me revert your attention back to cholidocolatiasis. As we have spoken before, cholidocolatiasis was stone in the common bile duct. Now, let's imagine that that stone comes further down, either at the level of the pancreatic duct or a little lower, right before the sphincter of OD. If this happens, then not only will you have cholidocolatiasis, but the patient will also develop gallstone pancreatitis. Now, let's talk about a rare cause of intestinal obstruction, gallstone ileus. Gallstone ileus results from erosion of a large stone through the gallbladder directly into the small intestine, creating an internal fistula between the gallbladder and the intestinal tract. This usually occurs at the level of the duodenum. Now, the stone doesn't usually cause obstruction at the level of the duodenum. It causes it lower down, where the bowel becomes very narrow, usually at the distal ileum, just proximal to the ileocecal valve. And these patients will present with signs and symptoms of small bowel obstruction uh, during early stages when the stone is not embedded in the distal ileum and is still in the duodenum it might have intermittent obstruction so patients may have nausea vomiting but still might continue to have bowel function and it's not until later stages when the stone is completely embedded in the ileum and causes a complete obstruction which will result in obstipation now let's move on to the diagnostic approach we're going to split this into labs and imaging in terms of the labs, first you're going to look at the hemoglobin and hematocrit, and this is helpful, especially if you have patient's baseline. If you see H and H is much higher than their baseline, then that's indicative of hemoconcentration second to dehydration. Therefore, it's your responsibility to adequately hydrate them. Next, you should look at the white count. It's usually high with acute cholecystitis and cholangitis due to the infection. Also, in order to detect obstruction at the level of this common bile duct, you need to look at bilirubin. Now, the two values of bilirubin uh, that you're given in your lab values, and they are direct and indirect bilirubin. Now, we'll talk about this in more detail in another video, but for biliary obstruction purposes, uh, you need to focus on direct or also known as conjugated bilirubin. These values are usually high when there's an obstruction at the level of common bile. And as we discussed before, this is seen with cholidocolatiasis, cholangitis, and gallstone pancreatitis. Now in terms of imaging, the initial test of choice with 95% sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of biliary tract diseases is the right upper quadrant ultrasound. It is a good detector for uh, common bile duct dilation, but not useful in visualizing stones in the bile duct. They can give you an idea if the common bile duct is distended or not, or if it's obstructed or not. And you can also do HIDA scan, which involves giving a radionuclide through an IV. And this radionuclide is excreted by the liver into the bile in high concentrations. And this in return enters the gallbladder. However, if the patient has acute cholecystitis and the cystic duct is obstructed, then the bile is not going to enter the gallbladder and the gallbladder won't light up. So if you can visualize the common bile duct and duodenum without the filling of the gallbladder after four hours of giving the radionuclide, then that's indicative of acute cholecystitis. CAT scan of the abdomen is also useful in detecting the level and the cause of the biliary obstruction. And in patients with jaundice, particularly with dilated ducts or evidence of extrahepatic obstruction on the ultrasound, these patients will benefit from an MRCP, which is replacing ERCP and PTC more and more these days. So an MRCP can be done to get a detailed radiographic imaging of the biliary ductal anatomy, and this can be helpful in confirming the diagnosis and planning for their management. All right, so now let's talk about management. In patients with cholelithiasis, dietary modification should be tried first, but if they don't work and patient comes in with recurrent biliary colics, then you can suggest elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In a patient with acute cholecystitis, laparoscopic cholecystectomy along with IV antibiotics is recommended. In patients with cholidocolithiasis, cholangitis, supertive cholangitis, and gallstone pancreatitis, ERCP should be performed to remove the stones and the bile. And then these patients will eventually need a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. 
either electively or during the same admission. Majority of the time is done during the same admission to avoid reoccurring of cholecholatizer or cholangitis. All right guys, that marks the end of the video. I hope you guys learned something new today. And if you did, then please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for future videos. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys next week.